Bum, bum, bum. Speaking of Courage Podcast, we're back in the studio. What's up, everybody? What's up, Chase? Hot, man. It is. Sweating already this like we've been running. This week has been brutal. Yeah. Everybody else listening around the world, we're in Southern California. <laughs> 116, right? Wasn't it something like that? I don't know what it is here, but Palm Springs and stuff, it's, it's up in the 120s. Tiff was in Vegas this week in 121. Oh, God. I've been in the house hiding. Insane, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hope your air, air conditioning doesn't run out. Yeah, seriously. So what you been up to? Uh, same old stuff, dude. Just work, working. Work, 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 yeah. Where are we going today? Adding on these. Uh, you said you're a World War II guy, so yeah. we're going with World War II. Sweet. When we stick to World War II, I like the Pacific War. Yeah. Uh, partly just because it interests me more, and partly because my unit fought in the Pacific. So we're, we're going to the uh, fighting the Japanese, the island hopping campaign in the Pacific, World okay. War II. Philippines or? Yeah. But, well, this isn't in the Philippines, but that's part of the island yeah. hopping campaign. It was a whole bunch of little small islands that uh, would otherwise have no uh, importance to American uh public had we not fought and died there so they have know. spots there that they would use that the enemy was using yeah so basically it's it's almost a war of bounding forward right we're trying to push closer and closer to the homeland so we can get to places where we can launch our aircraft from and we can launch attacks from and we have the you know the places to fuel our ships and everything yeah. like that Damn. Um, they're bound you know it's not like you can just fly straight to Japan and bomb them. You have to have a certain amount of fuel. You know, that's why we talked about Iwo Jima. Like and you have to be pad. able to launch. Exactly. And then the island hopping campaign, we're not necessarily going to go to every island where the Japanese are. We're going to go to, we'll take one island and then we'll bypass several and we'll take another one and starve those ones out behind us because they won't be able to resupply. So you're, you're strategically oh, yeah, picking cool. those islands. And then the Philippines were taken from us. We had a large number of troops there. So that was almost political to get those back if you want to call it that political. was macarthur yeah when he that left was MacArthur. and said he would come back exactly yeah. i shall return you know potentially it might have been more strategically apt to go around the philippines but um macarthur wanted to return so that became part of his because of the people right exactly yeah the people fought hard right the people fought hard and our guys were still there we had a large number of pow's on the island and, okay uh, there was two of the the big uh, pow camps and one they the japanese executed everybody they put him in a uh, air raid trench Lit them on fire with gasoline, and then when the guys survivors tried to run out, they'd shot everybody. So uh, Jesus, yeah, that was a uh, Palawan, and then Cabanatuan. We we actually rescued those survivors before. We As there, the so. Americans were coming, they did that. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So that was where the Vicious. largest number, the largest American surrender up to that point in in U.S. history was in the Philippines, Bataan, and Corregidor. So all those guys were there, and we needed to get them back before they were all Damn. murdered. Damn, that's you know. crazy. So who's our hero of the day? Yeah. So today we're dealing with uh, Benjamin Solomon. Solomon. Yeah, so he's going to be different for a number of reasons. Um, the biggest reason is, is he was actually a dentist by trade. So he's going Already to be, before uh, yeah. the military. <laughs> yeah, he was a dentist before the military, and he was a dentist in the military. How old was he when he enlisted? Uh, so he was born in 1914, and he ended up getting drafted in 1940. Oh, okay. So at the time of his Medal of Honor action, he was 29 years old. Damn, already a uh, dentist and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. He's he's uh, so he was born in uh, like I said September first, nineteen fourteen. He's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So he's all the way up there. I got some Wisconsin friends, Ross and uh, Town. You know, they they speak like they're Canadians. But uh, <laughs> uh, Solomon was actually Jewish, which uh, in nineteen fourteen in in the United States was going to be a little bit different than your yeah. average Wisconsinite that's going to be out there. Solomon was also an only child, which is a bit different than uh, you, yeah, you always definitely. key in on the, uh, the older, older brother. brother. A lot of these guys we deal with have huge families because it's that depression. And he's the time. only child. He's going to be the only child in this, in this family with his, um, his mother and father. And he's going to be raised up, you know, yeah. as, a Jew, as a Jewish child um, during these times. Growing up in Wisconsin, though, he's going to be involved in the Boy Scouts. And he's actually going to become an Eagle Scout, which I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, so... He's going to have a lot of those outdoor skills, um, you know, your typical American child in, in most of those ways, other than, you know, his background and his religion. He ends up attending uh, Shorewood High School, and then he goes to university, and then he ends up transferring to uh, USC, the University of Southern California. He comes out here for his undergraduate studies, which is actually kind of an accomplishment in itself, because during that time, they would only take a certain number of Jewish students. Really? Um, they had a, a cap on the number they, they would accept, so he was able Why to... Why is that? Just discrimination, anti-Semitism really? at the time. Yeah, people kind of tend to forget the anti-Semitism in this country. And, uh, you know, most... it was even prevalent here. Oh, yeah, for sure. Not, a, not obviously not as bad as it was in Europe and yeah. everything. But I mean, even through the 50s and 60s, there was country clubs and stuff where you couldn't come in if you had Jewish heritage or certain, wow, you know. I didn't yeah. even know that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that. Man, that's crazy. So a certain amount of students come in and he's elected one of them. Right. So he actually makes it. Um, he's going to finish there, and then he's going to go to USC Dental School, and he's going to graduate in 1937. So 
that's when he's going to begin his dental practice. So this is all prior to even being in the military. Wow. Right? So he's already successful. Yeah, he's already successful. I mean, he's a, he's, he has a doctorate. He's a, he's a full-on dentist. He has a dental practice in uh, L.A. So he's working in 1930s, late 1930s L.A. before the war even starts. He actually tried to join the Army as a dentist, but for whatever reason, size of the Army at the time, he wasn't accepted. They didn't need him. They didn't need him. They didn't need dentists at the time, I guess. Uh, yeah. In 1940, though, when war is on the horizon... He ended up getting drafted. So even before the war, that's when we started this big peacetime draft, and they actually started bringing people in. So he got drafted, but even though he was a doctor, essentially, you know, he had a doctorate. He's a, he's a full-on working dentist. He was drafted as a private, so he Jeez. became enlisted, just, you know, needs of the Army type thing. They drafted him as an infantryman. So we were talking Whoa. about people with different backgrounds earlier. You're going to have a bunch of 18 and 19-year-old kids, you know, farm kids, and then you have a guy that's, that's established, established, has a practicing dentist uh, or a dentist. Probably making good money. Oh, yeah. yeah you're a, a that, dentist in L.A. at the time. time. Oh, yeah. absolutely, right? Full-on established. He's going to be a little bit older guy, but he actually took to the Army and he enjoyed it. Instead of being bitter or complaining or, you know, I'm, hey, I'm a, I'm a dentist, shouldn't I at least be so an officer? So what happens in that case? He, get, he has a running practice. He gets drafted. He has to go. What happens to his business? Say goodbye. Oh, yeah. Yeah, try you to make arrangements. It, it kind of depends on what you're doing. Later on with the GI Bill of Rights, they, they made um, provisions that you, they would have to keep your job for you. But if you're running your own business, which essentially a dentist, dental practice is, yeah. there's no guarantee that your job's going to be there for you when you come back. Man, you know, so if, much more sacrifice. Oh, yeah, yeah. But again, no complaints. Um, he, the country needed him, so Benjamin Solomon went. He went as a private. He never made any complaints, and he, he partly because of his Eagle Scout background, partly because of everything else and just the kind of person he was. Is he aware of what's going on in Europe? Yeah, to, to his hair. To Absolutely. It? So, how how did the word was spreading already about what was yeah. going on with the Jewish? It's people? It's a good question. So the Holocaust. What we ended up finding out, yeah. you know, about six million people being earned in the ovens and all these concentration camps was not well known, and it wasn't known to that degree. But we did know is that all these refugees were fleeing Europe, and they were going all over, right? There was Jewish communities all over the United States that were getting distant cousins to come live with them because their Desperately. family was killed overseas, right? Yeah. So if you were of Jewish heritage, you're going to know somebody from the old world, as they call and it. And they're probably hearing the stories. And they're hearing the letter stories, or whatever. right? Yeah, and they're not knowing about the ovens and the concentration camps that may or may not have um, even been coming in at this time, depending on what time you're talking about, because those people weren't surviving to write letters home. Right. But we did know... Something was going on. Right. We knew about Kristallnacht. We knew about the Jewish, um, the, the laws they passed in uh, Nazi Germany that Jews weren't allowed to marry John, yeah. non-Jews. They couldn't have jobs, right? The people that had the means were fleeing. So we knew that something and was going on. And then once they went through the ghettos that, that time, is mm -hmm. that when it kind of spread? or The full account wasn't known until we actually liberated the camps, until the Damn. Soviets and the Americans started going into the camps. And people were shocked. Even you know Jewish Americans were shocked that going through. We... we even if somebody told you that at the time, you're yeah, not you, going to believe it. It's going to sound like yeah, but there was theory. clear anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, and there was you know there was persecution, and people were being rounded up and stripped of their rights. So they're going to be aware of that. So as a Jewish American like Solomon in 1940, that is going to be playing in the back of your mind. So right? is that his motivation? I don't know, but it's got to be. You it's have to be. have that playing into you. Yeah. Right. There's there's no way you wouldn't. Yeah. You, you know? feel a little more impassioned at the very least. And and even if you take out the Jewish question of all of this, you know, just seeing. Nazi Germany overrun all these other countries, right? September yeah. 1st, 1939, they invaded Poland. They're going through, um, you know, Czechoslovakia. They're taking all these places. A lot of Americans were second generation or third generation. So they're going to have family members in these countries. They're going to have some type of connection to Europe. And yeah, I didn't think about this. that. Yeah. yeah. So even if you're not Jewish, somebody's right? getting touched. If you're, you know, in Chicago and you're a Polish family, your Polish, your Polish family back home in the old country, your grandparents, and your you're cousins, hearing. Are, are going to have been attacked. If you're in New York, and New York's a very immigrant-rich population, you're going to have people from all over all yeah. these countries that are being invaded. Okay. Not to mention what's going on in the Pacific, right? Right. So, yeah, he takes to his training. Um, he ends up qualifying expert with rifle and pistol. While he's an infantryman, though, he's still, he's a bit older, and he has these dental skills, so he starts taking care of his guys. He's just kind of a natural leader. Even while they're out in the field and, or when they're back in the barracks, he's checking the other guy's teeth. You know, he's giving them cleanings and stuff. And yeah. Some of these kids are from the farm in the Depression. Never they probably never even had a, de <laughs> a dentist, you know. But he's, uh, he's taking care of them. He's giving them cl uh, teeth cleaning, and he's becoming a leader. During that time, he's an excellent soldier, though. He's an excellent marksman. He's an excellent machine gunner. And he um, was learning all these skills that would help him, which fell back on his Eagle Scout skills, essentially. 
within a year, he makes sergeant, and he's actually in charge of a machine gun section. So that kind of shows you how he is. And like I said, you always talk about being the oldest brother, but just being that much older than some of these yeah, guys, maybe you, even 10 years older at this happen. point, you're going you're gonna to be put into that position. As soon as he starts getting comfortable and starts taking to the Army life, though, they end up notifying him. The Army, in their infinite wisdom, finally realized, hey, we have these guys with um, you know, doctorate degrees that are private, so they actually told him they're going to commission him as a lieutenant, right? Right. They, they kind of fixed their mistake. So they told him they're going to commission him as a second lieutenant in the dental corps, and he actually asked, he wanted to stay in the infantry, because now, you know, yeah. yeah, I'm a dentist, but I'm over here. But they told him, hey, needs of the Army, you're going to be in the dental corps. So he gets commissioned as an officer, and they end up sending him to Hawaii, which is kind of getting ready for the Pacific. And that's another interesting point in World War II. You don't get to pick if you fight the Germans or the Japanese. You know, you go yeah. where, the, where the army sends you. So even if you're all geared to fight Nazi Germany, he's going to Hawaii, which means one thing. You're yeah. going to fight the Japanese, right? He continues on in his unit. Um, he, he continues to be an excellent soldier. In August of 1942, he was in the 102nd Infantry Regiment, and they actually had a competition, and he was declared the best all-around soldier of the unit. So just to show you what kind of guy he is. So the guys were behind him, too. Right, exactly. So he's an officer at this point, and he's, he's not an infantryman. He's a freaking dentist, but he's the best all-around soldier. So that shows you Damn. what kind of guy this, this person is, right? Um, while he's there in Hawaii, he ends up working in a hospital for several months because even though he's a dentist, they have medical skills, so they're going to be working closely with the uh, medical field. In May of 1943... He's assigned to the 105th Infantry Regiment, which is part of the 27th Infantry Division, and they're going to be one of these hard-fought units that, that ships overseas. Even as a dentist, when he'd finish his hours, he would go and he would train other guys, though. He was still training them with these infantry skills, and the commander actually said that he was one of the best, best instructors they had ever seen. So again, even though he's a dentist, he's right there with the infantry guys. Yeah. He's right there with all these Looking dudes. Out so for him. of course they're going to be respecting him, right? Yeah. Eventually, just like most of these units, the 27th Infantry Division is going to get shipped overseas. Now, at this point in the war, you know, we're getting on 1942, 43, 44. We're actually on the offensive. We're pushing the Japanese back. So it's island by island by island. And the combat that they're going to see, they're going to end up on a little island called Saipan, which if you don't know anything about World War II, you might not have ever heard that name. But if you know about World War II and especially Marine Corps history, this is going to be one of those horrendously bloody battles, these, these tiny specks of sand in the Pacific where thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of men are going to give their lives, They're right, on these tiny little places. So Saipan is, a, again, it's a small little island and a bigger island chain, but it has airfields, so we're going to be trying to push forward. The Japanese, I think there's about 29,000 Japanese soldiers. They're already soldiers. bedded down there? They've been there for years digging in, yeah. right? So we're going to land there. And all these little islands in the Pacific, the Japanese don't know where we're going to come, so they're just digging in. Yeah. They're ready to die for the emperor, right? They're not going to go home with shame, so they're willing to die rather than give up those islands. And Saipan's going to be one of those. Like I said, I think it was 29,000 people were on that island, just fortifying it, turning it into a fortress. Is it, are there cities? Is it, no. It's no, just it's going to be bunkers. You're going to have an airfield. You're going to have some underground tunnels on a lot of these islands. On others, you're just going to have, you know, structures and tents. Um, Saipan has a civilian population, but it's going to be villages rather than cities, right. you know, or, or anything. There's not like local businesses and stuff? No, not necessarily. It's more primitive than that. Yeah. Uh, not to be a disrespectful term, but just, just like I said, villages, village style. Vibe, yeah. If Interesting. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So they're just there for years, right. bedding down, and then you're going to fly. Where do you even, I mean, you just go to the beach? And that's part of the problem. You, you have to find a you beach. You fly in. Right. You have to find a beach that's suitable for landing craft, right? So if you only have one beach that's suitable for landing craft, and you're the Japanese, where are you going to set up all exactly. your machine guns, right? If, you're, if we're lucky, we're going to have multiple places we can land and kind of keep them off guard. But if we're not, it's literally, you know where they're going to land. The send the waves. and you just have to take acceptable losses. We'll do a naval bombardment. We'll try to bomb them as much as we can try to get their heads down and kill them, and then we'll have the aircrafts come over, try to get their heads down and kill them, and then we're going to land those, those bodies on the shore. Damn. Yeah, so uh, June 5th, 1944, American troops are going to land on Saipan. It's got to seem insurmountable. It, yeah, especially if you're in that little landing craft body. Are you aware of what you're oh, up yeah. against in, oh, yeah. as an American? Oh, yeah. yeah. Some of these guys are veterans. Um, some of these guys will have been on other campaigns, especially the Marines that are on these island hopping campaigns. You're going to see the newsreels back home. You know, yeah. you might have had brothers or cousins that are in other units. You're hearing, you're seeing the casualty numbers, you know. If you get sent to a unit as a replacement, that's because yeah. men, are, men are dying, essentially, right? You're filling a dead man's shoes. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah they, they are very painfully aware 
the early days of the war where you think you're just going to go knock the enemy out and go home are long gone. Yeah. Right? This, is, this is 1944. We've already fought on Guadalcanal. We've already fought on, in, you know, partly in the Philippines. We've already fought on Midway. We've already fought on all these places. We've seen how hard the Japanese are willing to defend what, right. they, what they are, you know, Tarawa, ba- Badio, all these places. So you, you know what you're getting into. Damn, that's got to be terrifying in, yeah. the boat, in the boats. Oh, God, yeah. What's going through your head at that moment, dude? Well... <laughs> Are you ever going to see your family again? You know, they, they often tell you, look to your left and look to your right. One of these guys isn't coming home, you know, and you, and you just kind of have to know that. And you have to know, is it going to be you? Are the bullets coming at you immediately? Or it they depends. Wait? Different situations. So there's certain islands where the Japanese will just let us get inland and then they'll attack us yeah. to bog us down. Um, like Iwo Jima, we got on the shore and then they opened up. There's other islands where as soon as you attack, they're, they're lighting you up on the uh, yeah. shoreline and stuff. So you don't know how that's going to be either. Is it going to be an easy landing or is it going to be a hard landing? Are there airplanes going? Yeah. So we're going to have the aircraft go over for reconnaissance, but we've had that too, where the airplanes will go over and they'll say, there's no enemy on this island, we're good, and then you land and we get chewed up. So you yeah. never really know what Because of the trust. tunnel systems? Yeah, because of all kinds of things. The other big thing about Saipan, like I said, they, they actually, sometimes they'll call it the D-Day of the Pacific, because if you count the dates, June 6, 1944 is when we landed in Europe. Yeah. Right. When we landed on France, saving Private Ryan, June 5th, 1944 is Saipan. So it's going to be very much overshadowed by that. But these two different parts of the world, you know, doing the same type of invasion. Exactly. And the war in Europe, D-Day is is huge. It's one of the biggest events in, um, you know, in military history and American history and all these things. But if you're a soldier in the in, on Saipan, you couldn't give a shit less about yeah. it because you're you're only caring about your life. Right. Yeah. But the troops land, and they come ashore, and they, they start to take heavy casualties um, right away. But they actually, they're doing a good job. The uh, 105th advances uh, onto the island, and they're making good progress. But the fighting is very heavy, and the casualties are very high. So they're taking a lot of bodies for every inch of ground they gain. Solomon's actually, um, he's still a dentist at the time. But the battalion surgeon for 2nd Battalion is wounded by a mortar, uh, a mortar attack, which shows you how intense the combat yeah. is. The battalion surgeon, who should be far out of the line, is wounded. So Solomon volunteered to take his place, right? Damn. People don't really need their teeth cleaned right now, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to be this battalion surgeon. I'll be doing these emergency surgeries, essentially, on these guys behind the front line. So that's what Solomon ends up doing. That's what he's doing, surgeries? Yeah, so basically the front line stuff, right? So, so a medic's going to drag wounded. you under the, uh, you know, and throw a tourniquet on you. They're going to drag you back to an aid station, and Solomon and guys like him are going to be trying to keep you alive until they can get you to a the real mash hospital. mash type of thing? Yeah. Yeah. But this is really close to the front lines, yeah. right? Like, you can still hear the bullets flying, and these guys are still, you know, actively bleeding as they're being dragged in. And, and there's, like, an area on the island where they're doing this? Wherever you establish one. Oh, so right? it's literally so when you a push, camp. Right, exactly. Yeah, when you initially land, there's nothing behind you, and you have to push forward, and as you move forward, that's the front line. So everything gonna behind the front up. line is, right, so you're going to be putting up your tents, or you're going to be putting up things. Um, if you can get people back to the hospital ships, that's going to be your best bet, but if you can't get them there right away because someone's got a sucking chest wound, or they're bleeding, or they need yeah. a tracheotomy, you need to have guys like Solomon who can do that on the shore. Damn. Young, just thrown in young it. guys, like, yeah, it's a meat grinder, man. and he's a dentist, and he's a dentist by trade. Like you know, he's, he's going to have some other training, and he has some infantry training too. Yeah. But yeah, he's this isn't he hasn't spent eight years going to college for you know to be a doctor. He's 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 a dentist by trade, man. Yeah. So the twenty um, seventh uh, infantry division, one hundred fifth, they're pushing forward just like all these other units that are on Saipan. And again, this is jungle fighting. So not only are you fighting the enemy, you're fighting the terrain, right? You're yep. fighting those thick groves. You can't see where anything is, which to me is what is terrifying about it because you don't know every tree and every bush there could be a Japanese soldier behind it. They're hiding in the trees as snipers, thick. though. Yeah, it's thick in certain places. In other places, you're going to have like beach landscape. You know, you're moving forward and you don't know if they're going to pop out of a foxhole or a spider hole. You don't know any of that stuff. It's Damn. it's just terrifying. Every night you bed down, you're going to be, you know, getting very little sleep because you don't know if they're going to try to infiltrate or yeah, you don't the know what it's going to be. Yeah, the has got to be crazy. Exactly. But because they have to, they push forward. So by June 27th, they secure the peninsula, Nafutan Peninsula, Nafutan Peninsula. They actually secure the, uh, this big chunk of the island. So we're pushing the Japanese back. We're doing a good job. But the casualties are huge. The casualties are enormous. The Japanese have lost over 20,000 people killed on this battle by this point. All right. 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 By the time we get to the end of June, the beginning of July. So around the 4th of July, the Japanese, they started with about 29,000 people. About 20,000 dead Japanese are on this island. Now, what's happening with the bodies? 
they're laying there to rot. They're being eaten by insects and animals. So we're, just we're coming through the battles. We're winning the battles, mm-hmm. pushing forward. Those bodies are now behind us in our ground. Yeah. What do we do? Well, we'd, we, if we had the time, we'd put them in big mass graves, you know, yeah. and uh, put lye and things on them. But in this kind of situation, they're just going to fl- lay many. where they fall in the jungle. Yeah. Just let it go. Remember the um, J.R. McKinney episode when he yes. said it seems a horrible thing to die like that, but some yeah. boys did. Yeah, just on a trail somewhere. Their Japanese families back home never knowing what's going to happen to them. They're just kind of being absorbed by the earth. It's got to just stink and yeah. be nasty. Oh, yeah. And that's, again, the 20,000 number. If you're a frontline soldier, you've, you've killed some of these people or you've at least seen these things or you're seeing these dead bodies. And it's, it's a shocking thing to go from, you know, the 1940s lifestyle where we didn't have TV and we didn't have yeah. these violent images and movies to now you're surrounded by that's a, a, good point. a hellish landscape of zombies. <laughs> you that's know? a good point. Dude. Yeah. Yeah, because it's nowadays you see that kind of stuff. You can go on the internet and look up anything. Exactly. Back then it was nothing. Mm-hmm. Back then you're watching those, you know, those those Hollywood movies where you the cowboy shoots the bad guy and there's no blood. Yeah. And now you're seeing guys get ripped apart by machine guns and your buddy's dying in your arms and you're seeing the Japanese with their head exploded and people are stabbing each other, you know. Yeah, and guys are fighting each other with, you know, hand to hand combat and stuff. It's a it's a shocking thing. It's a sadistic thing just to witness, I would imagine. But man. they're but they're adapting to it because human beings can adapt adapt to anything, even if it's horrible horrific as this and that's what they do yeah so what kind of space are we talking with twenty thousand dead like an area uh i don't know the actual square footage of the island but i mean every every you know the size of your backyard you're gonna have several dead people in yeah. it you know it's it's the whole ground is littered with it and the enemy is everywhere like i said there's going to be some of them up in the trees uh, tied to the trees as the snipers would be there's going to be some of them in foxholes and then there's going to be their major units moving around you know Think and th- how are we just so effective at this point well right now it's it's almost a war of attrition right the japanese as long as we keep firing with artillery, we keep firing with our ships, we keep bombing them with the planes in front of us, and then every time we see them, we're able to mow them down. They're going to run out of bodies, and they're going to run out of people. We're fighting a, a unit that is maximized at the number they have. We can keep sending bodies in right? Yeah. We're on the offensive. They're cut off. They're fighting a last stand. On almost every island we're they fighting them They have no reinforcements. They have no hope of reinforcement. Our ships are going to crush them out at sea. There were certain islands where, where the naval uh, engagements were not assured but on at this point in time our navy owned the land or the the ocean around the island right Damn. so, so they cut have off they have no hope of so getting it's a out. Mat- just a matter of time exactly you may get you may get me but my buddies are getting you exactly. for sure all we got to do is keep killing them and then they won't be able to fight anymore yeah. essentially and all they want to do is kill as many of us so they can't get every american they kill is one american that's not getting to their homeland yeah and every japanese we kill is one less that the guys behind us have to kill so it's just a brutal tooth and claw man hellish 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 fight with, right with a lot of odds at stake man. exactly and and especially for them experienced fighters yeah so on july 4th they start their final drive to secure the island right the we know where we have this island we just got to get rid of these so it's been a guys. month yeah so we, we landed on uh, june 4th or sorry june 5th and now it's july 4th so about a month of fighting twenty thousand japanese dead Jesus. the 105th is going to be inserted on in a coastal plain near a tanapag village i believe it's called i'm sure i'm pronouncing that wrong but yeah. there's a small village that's going to be behind them and we're going to push forward again so we're making another landing we're moving inland the, our unit's going to advance about 800 yards, and then they're going to get uh, bogged down by intense Japanese resistance, right? So they're able to move through this area, and they're able to get good advancement. Hey, maybe they're all dead type of thing. And then we get, we get to their line of defense, essentially, right? So we get bogged down. That means the Japanese are fighting. Every f- place we step forward is, is getting rough. As night starts to fall, though, we're going to bring it into a tight perimeter. We're not going to be on the offensive at night. We don't have the advantage. So we're going to just bring it in tight. Everybody get in your foxholes. Everybody dig in. Everybody have your sandbags. We're going to have our artillery behind us, and we're going to be preparing for this long fight. Right. And you can imagine, again, we've been there for a month, so every night you're, you're terrified. So you're getting very little sleep. And you're getting a desperate enemy, dude. Right. You're getting, they're, they've you, seen 30 days of more than 800 of their friends getting killed by, per day. Exactly. And you know they're going to make a last stand, so you yes. just don't know when it's coming. So, you know, Donnie and I, you and I, we're going to be in a foxhole. You sleep two hours, I'll sleep two hours. How much of that two hours am I really going to be able no. to sleep, right? The, the only sleep I'm going to get is because I'm so freaking and exhausted but that you just not out every sound you hear in the jungle every animal every crab anything like that you, is that an enemy soldier you know if somebody starts firing everybody's going to be freaking out we're sitting there trying to basically get ready for the next day get ready for the continued push meanwhile on the other side of the island the japanese general has bringing all his troops together there's about five to six thousand troops they estimate at this point he's bringing them all together and he's telling them we are all going to die but we're going to die honorable deaths right so all these japanese He's telling them, we're running out of ammo. 
who are running out of man, now is the time to die. So we're going to make this final charge at these Americans, that's, right? That's literally what he this said. This is literally what happened. He, he literally told them, for every one of you that dies, take 10 Americans with you. That's your goal. We are all going to die. No ifs, ands, or buts, but you need to die an honorable death, basically. What a courageous group. Exactly. So they get together, and they do it. That's what they decide. So on the evening of July 6th, while we're bedding down, the Japanese are preparing for their final attack. They're saying their prayers, you know, they're doing whatever they're doing to make peace with whatever they believe in because this is their last night on earth. Dude. We're fighting to stay alive. They are accepting their death and they're going to die like warriors. Man. And to prove his commitment, the Japanese officer, uh, we've talked about seppuku before. Yeah. He committed seppuku. He disemboweled himself with a knife. <laughs> and then, that uh, night? Yeah. So before the attack, he ended up, uh, he, he, in samurai tradition, you disembowel yourself, and if you're unable to complete that Z incision, your, your partner will chop your head off. His partner shot him in the head after he disemboweled himself because he couldn't finish the action. So to show you his commitment to not be dishonored and let the Americans take him, essentially. Holy. So then his troops are going to go forward, and they're going to make this final attack. Damn. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the enemy we're facing. Like a badass enemy. Yeah, so July 7th, 1944. Solomon is 29 years old. The Americans are out front in their foxholes as the sun's coming up. Solomon's aid station is 50 yards from the front. So we talked about where these are. So he's going to have a tent, essentially, right? You're going to have a tent with all these wounded guys. You're going to have a tent with all these guys that have been shot over the last 30 days, that have malaria, that have trench foot, that have all these things. There's going to be guys, you know, laying on uh, stretchers. There's going to be guys that can't see. There's going to be guys that are barely alive. There's going to be guys that are waiting to get back to the rear. And you're going to have Solomon and his medics, and they're going to be working on them. Meanwhile, the Japanese are creeping towards these lines. So our Americans, we're waking up, we're trying to... 50 yards? Get ready for the day. 50 yards ahead of Solomon, the Japanese are approaching. These Japanese have already made peace with their lives, that their lives are over. So they're crawling forward through the brush. And there's this heavy brush that's about 400 yards out in the front of the American position. So they're able to sneak through this brush without the Americans seeing them. So... While they're loading their rifles and washing their faces and trying to get something to eat, the Japanese are crawling towards their destiny, right? While the Japanese are crawling, Solomon's working on patience. Solomon's checking the day. He's getting ready for his orders. At 5 a.m., the Japanese stand up and they rush forward in a tidal wave. And this ends up being the largest or one of the largest bonsai charges in the whole Pacific War. Five to six, I'm sorry, three to 5,000 Japanese rush the American position. Now, this is about two battalions worth of Americans. So two, a couple Jesus. hundred Americans are desperately fighting. 18 to 19-year-old kids. Again, kids from the farm, kids that had no intention of ever being professional soldiers until they were drafted. They're fighting with their M1 Grands with these eight-round magazines, or eight-round clips, I'm sorry, these were clips at the time, and their spring thuds, their machine guns, they're trying to go thousands, literally thousands Just of running desperate, at you like desperate Japanese are running at you. The Japanese are firing their rifles with the ammunition they have. They're stabbing forward with their bayonets. They're using their makeshift bamboo spears that they made, and they're stabbing and killing the Americans in the American position, right? Damn. So in these early morning hours, we're doing everything we can. We're fighting as hard as we can. Our troops are trying to overcome this attack, but there's so much chaos too, right? From foxhole to foxhole, all you're seeing is, man, your, our machine guns are firing. They're firing so much that they're having to clear bodies out of the way because there's so many bodies in their line of fire. Our and riflemen are firing, coming. and they just keep coming. Our riflemen are firing until their magazines are out, and then as they're trying to reload a clip into their Garand, they're getting overrun, they're getting stabbed. You're watching your buddy get killed. Meanwhile, Solomon's in his uh, aid tent, and he's trying to get these guys he knows things are bad because casualties start streaming to the rear, right? Guys start falling back from their positions. Guys start retreating to the They're village. They're probably running up to some them. Some of them are running, and some of these guys are running in, holding their guts. They're screaming for help. So they, they start getting more and more people. They start coming in, and Solomon and his men are frantically keeping, trying to keep these guys alive, right? Because that's their job. They're trying to get bandages on tree people. They're Jeez. triaging. Grab that guy. Put this guy over here. If you can get up, get up, right? Get out of here if you can or whatever that may be. The Americans on the line are doing everything they can to fight because these are brave men too. But the wave and the size of the Japanese, they're going to overrun this perimeter, right? So there's hand-to-hand -hand combat on the line. And this is Damn. only 50 yards, about 50 yards in front of his position. Damn. So this morning, Solomon's going to be hearing gunfire. You're going to be hearing machine guns. You're going to be hearing Japanese screaming. screaming. You're going to be hearing Japanese singing. You're going to be hearing Americans screaming. You're going to be hearing explosions. You're going to be hearing rockets and mortars. You're going to be hearing our Sounds artillery. Like chaos. It is chaos, <laughs> right? Radios going nuts. Exactly. People frantically trying to find people in charge. It's, it's just the most chaotic situation you can see. So Solomon's trying to do his job, though. He's got to keep these guys alive. 
as he's working on him, he looks out and he sees the bodies that he has laying in front. He sees a Japanese soldier bayoneting some of the wounded soldiers who are laying on the ground. The Japanese have breached the line and they're to the tent now. So they're bayoneting Solomon's wounded soldiers that he's supposed to be taking Jeez, care of. The ones that are laying there exactly. injured? Exactly. The ones that are already laying there injured, defenseless. Trying the Japanese are coming at him and they're stabbing him. So Solomon grabs his equi- the uh, M1 Garand that he sees lying next to him. The first rifle he sees, he grabs, he takes a squatting position, and he immediately kills that enemy soldier that's bayoneting those guys, right? And then he goes back, and he's trying to treat people. As he turns his attention back to the wounded, two more Japanese soldiers appear in front of the tent. Can you imagine how terrifying that is if you're laying in bed and you look up, you know, you've already got a chest wound and the Japanese are on top of you now. Uh, and they're merciless. They're going to be bayoneting you. They want to kill you. They want to get their 10. But Solomon takes his rifle and he charges into them and he clubs them and he shoots them and he kills these two guys. And now we're in, we're in this moment where he's trying to get to treat the wounded, but he's realizing there's no hope, right? After he kills these, four more Japanese soldiers start crawling under the sides of the tent, almost like ants, you know? Anywhere yeah. you squash them, they're just coming. So he immediately gets into action. One of these Japanese has a knife or a bayonet. Solomon actually kicked the bayonet out of his hand, and then he shot him and killed him. He ended up uh, either headbutting or rifle butting the other. It's unclear. And then he stabbed one with the bayonet. He was locked in hand-to-hand combat with the fourth soldier when one of the wounded soldiers picked up a weapon and killed the soldier. Um, by this point, though, you have to understand how, how bad things are if this many guys are in the tent, right? This is this is, this is desperate Think about how fighting. many are outside the tent. Exactly. And think about that. What's me, what that means. There's supposed to be 50 yards in between me and the front lines. But clearly, there's, the line is porous. These guys have broken through. Yeah. Right? And like we talked about, we can't call for mortar fire. We can't call for artillery fire because they're on top of us. So Solomon looks around, and he has to make this decision, right? He sees a lot of our troops running back to the village, and he knows he can run. But if he runs, his guys are going to die. If he leaves, if he turns his back, everyone there that he's responsible for is going to die. And he's an officer, and he's a medical man, right? So he knows that they're counting on him. So he makes a decision. He decides that he's going to do what he can to defend these guys' lives. So he grabs a rifle, and he runs out of the tent to face the enemy. He turned back to the other medics, and he told them, get everybody out of here. And he tells all the wounded, if you can get up, get back to the village. All he's got is a rifle with an eight-round clip, essentially, right? And the last words anybody heard him say were, I'll hold them off until you get them to safety. I'll see you later. And then he charged out into the fray. So these guys were able to fall back, and Solomon ran out with his rifle. I don't know what he thought he was going to do with his rifle, but he knew he had to try, just like all these other guys. So he runs directly into the breach. He runs right into the face of death, right into these charging with his, with his enemy. As he does so, he's seeing guys in hand-to-hand combat. He's seeing guys getting stabbed. He's seeing guys getting killed. But he also looks, and he sees a machine gun an American machine gun that has four dead Americans slumped around it. The whole machine gun crew is dead. Even though he's a medical man, he was an infantryman before, so he knows how to use that machine gun, yeah. right? But he also knows if you touch that machine gun, you're going to be a target and you're going to get cut cal? down. Is it a 50 cal? It would probably be a 30 cal at this okay. point. Yeah, because these, these World War II machine guns. So Solomon's going to run through enemy fire and he's going to get up on that gun so he can get his men a chance to survive. So Solomon gets that gun working and he starts firing. As all these Americans are retreating, they can hear Solomon's gun shattering, right? They hear this machine gun going. It's the only uh, crew serve weapon in this area that's holding these guys back. So because of his actions, these guys are able to get to safety. They're able to get to the village, and they're able to survive to form a defensive perimeter and fight. Like I said, Solomon's last words were, get them to safety, and I'll see you later. Damn. The fighting continued for two more days, and no one heard from Solomon. When they finally moved back on July 8th and they found the position... They found Solomon slumped over the gun. By the end of this fighting, 919 Americans had been either wounded or killed, which is a casualty rate of 83%, which is insane. 10% is a lot. 83% casualty rate. 83% of the guys that were there were dead. Wounded or killed. So that's going to include wounded. The Army team, the investigators, though, when they found Solomon's body... They found him slumped over the machine gun, and he was surrounded by the bodies of 98 enemy soldiers that he had killed in his last stand. So before he died, he had killed 98 of the enemy soldiers. They were able to determine by the drag marks in the sand and the blood that was dripping out of Solomon that he had moved his machine gun four times by himself. So during this desperate fighting, he was able to shoot so many that they would get up blocked in front of him, and then he, through sheer will, drug that machine gun, despite the fact that he had 76 bullet wounds and many bayonet wounds in his body. Damn. (laughs) So after fighting in the tent, Solomon rushed to that machine gun. He was wounded 76 times by bullet and bayonet, and they believe at least 24 of those while he was alive, and the rest of them would have been after because he caused such a great toll on the enemy that they just stuck around and kept stabbing and sticking and shooting his body. 98 dead enemy troops to enable his guys to live. What a badass. Yeah, so... 
That's a ra- that's some Rambo shit. Yeah, that's some Rambo shit from a dentist. Yeah, dude. from an officer and a dentist, right? You can just imagine him screaming over that gun. Exactly. Dude. I, the last last words again. Get out of here. And then the last scene, charging into the fray. And then after that, he charges to a machine gun and he just starts putting it down. That machine gun had laid empty, right? Four guys were on it and they were dead. There were other Americans in the area, but they couldn't get to that. But he at that point, I feel like when he left the tent, he might have known he was gonna, or he might have thought he had a chance. But as soon as he saw that machine gun, it's it's you know you're dead, right? Yeah. But he still charged forward and he still stayed on that gun and he had the knowledge of how to use it, right? 98 enemy dead that were just around his piles that he killed. Damn, dude, that's insane. So of course for his actions, that should be an automatic medal of honor, right? right. But... <laughs> not the case. Not the case. Because Solomon was a medic, essentially, he was wearing a red cross brassard on his arm, yeah. which means that he, uh, basically he violated the Geneva Conventions <laughs> by his actions. Really? Okay, so the um, Captain Edmund Love, who's actually the 27th Division historian, was one of the guys that found his body. Also the commanding general, and they immediately were like, this is one of the most powerful things we've ever seen. So Love wrote the citation, and he sent it up to the, the commanding general, and the general had to turn it down and refuse it because it was a violation of the Geneva Convention. And he wrote back, I am deeply sorry that I cannot approve the award of the medal to the captain, to Captain Solomon, although he richly deserves it. At the time of his death, this officer was in the medical service and wore a Red Cross brassard upon his arm. Under the rules of the Geneva Convention, to which the United States Army subscribes, no medical officer can bear arms against the enemy. So they took this literal interpretation that the Geneva Convention says if you're wearing a Red Cross armband, that the enemy's not supposed to shoot at you. Therefore, you're not supposed to bear arms or shoot back unless it's to defend your guys. What the hell? Right? So you can have a pistol, you can have a rifle in certain cases, but you can only be in a defensive situation. Because he got up on that machine gun, which is an offensive crew-served weapon, they actually denied him the medal. Later on, um, Love continued to try to petition for his medal. So in 1951, he resubmitted the medal, and they actually turned it down again, this time because too much time had passed. There's a two-year window, I think. So yeah. again, he was denied the medal. In 1969, they again submitted it. A different, uh, the Surgeon General of the Army uh, submitted it forward, and the recommendation was returned without action. Again, there had just been too much time. In 1998... It was resubmitted by the USC Dental School. Some more researchers. Everybody that would read this story was trying to resubmit him uh, up to the Dental Corps. Finally, in 2002, George W. Bush presented Samson, I'm sorry, Solomon's Medal of Honor to Dr. West. And uh, it was, unfortunately, he had no family members alive, so nobody oh, was around man. at the time because he was the only child. But justice was finally done in that yeah. sense, and uh, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, which can now be seen at the uh, Army Medical Department in San Antonio, Texas, where all the med- medics go for their training. That's awesome. Yeah. What a great story, man. Yeah, he's, he's one of my favorites, and I have my uh, Pacific War up here. I had the whole infantry kit on him, and I went ahead and took it off because, uh, you know, if he's in an aid station, he's not going to have a weapon. Yeah. He's not even going to be bearing one. So weapons. this is what he would be wearing. Something like that, yeah. Like he might have a smock on or everything, yeah. But he's not going to have all the rifleman's gear. He's not going to have the cartridge belt because he's not expected to fight. He's not there to kill the enemy, yeah. right? But when it came time... And there were Japanese soldiers bayoneting his men, the guys that were under his care, right? right? He took up a rifle, and he immediately cut them down with He skill. just seems like such a badass. Like a, he's like a straight military Jocko-type dude where they're from time, you know, everything they do, they're good at. If In some sense, yeah, he's like he's... He's the uh, all-around best soldier of the unit. Yeah. You know, he's he an went older to the school guy. of dentistry, he's the captain. finished that. He was the best marksman. He was everything the... he does. Uh, everything he does, he just seems to be yeah. good. Yeah, he became a, a section leader. In you know, within a year, he makes sergeant in the peacetime army or works the super early hard. War. Yeah, just taking his off hours and going and training. That's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. He's doing the extra mile everywhere. But on the other side, he's a Jewish dentist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, right. Twenty nine years old, which you could look at the other way too. Yeah. You know. Generally, you don't think of dentists as big, buff badasses, but it just kind of goes to show you that regardless of where you are, you don't know where someone else has been. You know, you might yeah. find yourself in a situation. You don't know what someone's background what may be, ass, you know. Man. And this guy's background was, was he was an Eagle Scout and he was an infantry soldier prior to, be, prior to being a dentist. And he wasn't married? He was not married to my knowledge. Yeah. Damn. No well, kids, no nothing yeah, you like that. Kids. Man, that's a cool story. Yeah, so fortunately, the uh, medical department carries on his legacy. And he's, he's, I, I've seen his name come up on the internet on all those stupid little articles, like most badass this and that. Yeah. You know? So he does have a little bit of name recognition, partly because just of the novelty that he was a dentist and yeah. he wasn't even a proper medical man in that sense, even though he was acting as a uh, battalion surgeon. Yeah. But against the Battle of Saipan or this last machine gun church, there's so many little spots in the Pacific that are littered with are dead still to this day and the Japanese dead and all these little specks of sand that 
would be completely insignificant to human history had we not waged this horrific war there, yes. you know? But it goes to show you what people will do in this when the situation comes, how they meet this challenge. Think about how much courage was happening on both sides of the line. Oh, God. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, imagine hearing that general's speech to his troops mm-hmm. on, the, on the Japanese side. Right. And yeah. just being in that, wherever they were when he mm-hmm. gave that speech, like, right. hey, we're all dying. Exactly. And having your men with you. Mm-hmm. And yeah, walking the, into the face of death on both sides. The, the Japanese Imperial Army did some of the most horrific things in the history of warfare. Yeah. That by no means am I defending or no, forgiving no, them. No, no, just but I'm you just talking about the moments. Yeah, you can't read about the Japanese soldiers and not just be in awe of their of their courage yeah. in all these charges, right? You yeah. know, running down machine guns when you know you're going to die, and your only goal is to kill. Like and, I said. Our troops are preparing to defend themselves. Their troops are preparing to die, period. You know? And not only that, okay, so then you have that, which is like a crazy, courageous army that's taped. They're making their, or they're making their last stand. Mm-hmm. And then you have our guy right. seeing that. Exactly. And running toward it. Yeah, and facing that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That you, we just built the Japanese up, rightfully so, of, of how ferocious and how scary yeah. they are. And then you still have someone. Yeah. Who single handedly? Who wouldn't be criticized for falling back no. because he's a medical man, right? Yeah, he, and he, he doesn't. It would even probably have a, be smarter. He doesn't to. even have a weapon. Yeah, by all means, he would be able to go. And if he grabbed someone and carried him, he'd probably be a hero for that, you yeah. know. But instead, he charges into the front foray and he charges through while giving his other guys these commands. To and go he's back. charging through with a freaking amazing life that exactly. he's willing to give up. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't just a poor farmer. Not that that's right. any less, but right. it kind of is on some level. I mean, yeah. you got an established practice. You're mm-hmm. successful. You're a USC grad. You got you're your doctorate. In the army, your, your life, vet, yeah. man, you have a good life to go mm-hmm. back to. You have you everything were, to lose. Yes, right. And you were willing to do it without hesitation. And he's a cat. Like I said, a lot of times I just was reading something on Facebook when people were bad mouthing officers and stuff. It's like these these are the officers of the United States military too. Yeah, you know, you for every crappy lieutenant you see in a movie, there's there's guys like John Bobo or there's guys like Ben Solomon who are yeah. these people, and that's why you know. America's mothers and fathers will send their sons to fight because they're under the command of people like these, yeah. you know, and that's what we expect <laughs> in a yeah. sense. Obviously not this, this, to this caliber, but this is what is expected of officers, and this is what many of them do. Yeah, and, and that's the type of guy, I, I can already imagine what kind of duty he was. He yeah. was the guy that was the first one there, the mm-hmm. last one to leave, doing all the extra work. Finishing your, your long day in the, uh, the hospital, doing your dental work, which is boring work, I would imagine, and then going out to the field and seeing the guys. Or even just backtrack. Like I said, when he was an infantry private when you're off you're freaking tired but he's telling the other guys hey lay down on the bunk let me check your teeth you know yeah. and, and like i said i guarantee you some of those guys have never seen a dentist I, yeah there's people in the army today who've never seen a dentist yeah. so i guarantee you in 1940 41 forms 42. a leadership quality like in jiu-jitsu that mm-hmm. we've, we've been doing jiu-jitsu recently and like some of the higher belts will yeah. say yeah stay after class i'm gonna help exactly. you work on it. they don't have to do that mm-hmm. you know what i mean you immediately look up to them as like a leader f- position it's weird like they kind of take you under their wing and, and how much respect do you gain oh you know immediately went for them to take their time and do yeah, that when, when they, they don't, don't have, have to. to when they don't have yeah to. yeah it's actually probably easier on their day to not exactly you would you respect know? them either way but the fact that they're they're they don't have an ego and yeah. they're pushing that aside and they're sharing something to try to help right? you so again in a solomon type situation the guy that's doing that now if he tells me now he's not an infantry commander but if you have an infantry commander that's acting like that and then he tells you hey i need you to flank and go after that machine done. gun position done i'll follow you into hell yes you're not gonna you know good leaders lead they don't yes. push they you've taken time out of your day when you're tired and you you could rightfully so go rest yeah. to help me train and prepare for something that could kill me. And you've proved your character to me that I know you wouldn't ask me to do this if you didn't have to. Yes. So I'm going to do it. And that's what a leader does. And that's what Ben Solomon does. You know, yeah. that's what he did. And like you said, just those... Those moments for me, though, when you when you have the, you guys get back, I'm going to try to hold them I off. Love like it. I love it. just, you know, it's it's so powerful, bumps, you know. Dude. And you can just picture that soldier who's been shot, who's wounded, and he's, you know, he's desperate. And you look back over your shoulder, and the last thing you see is a dentist with glasses running outside. Running you know what I mean? To give you a chance to escape. To yeah. give you a chance to fall back. If he wouldn't have done that, the Japanese are literally, like I said, I can just I picture them like, like ants. Just going, yeah. what, no matter which way you look, they're coming. He's killing them as they're coming through the flaps, and then they start coming under the bottom of the tent just to kill Americans, just yes. to stab the wounded. They're not even going after the combat soldiers. They just want to kill anybody before they die. They're, yeah. they're frenzied, you know? And he's putting them down efficiently and, and heroically. How many times in these, dude, do you think, like, the people witnessing it, like, stopped for a second and just went, <laughs> Yeah. Damn. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, like, and you wonder if, if any of them were thinking, man, I wish I could stay if yeah. I wasn't for my or, wounds. Or, or, God, I wish I had that courage yeah. and turning the other way. Well, we've talked about Mitchell Redcloud in the other episodes and how yeah. it inspired heroism, you know, and guys that were looking back over their shoulder and they, they realized what they were witnessing. You yeah. Know, they realized what they were seeing. Or J.R. McKinney, you know, guys yeah, oh, were man. the guy that was the whole time he was watching him and he said, this is the only guy, the only thing that's keeping me alive is J.R. right now. You yeah. Know? These guys that are, are seeing this and they are aware of how desperate the situation it is. Makes sense when they do write the citations or mm-hmm. they or they testify for it and they go no you know what i mean like yeah. you don't understand right like, yeah i won't let this die yes <laughs> exactly yeah. speaking of which i'm gonna go ahead and read a citation yeah, i it. often forget so i have it here all right for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty captain ben solomon was serving at saipan in the marianas islands on july 7th 1944 as the surgeon for the second battalion 105th Infantry Regiment, 28th Infantry Division. The regiment's 1st and 2nd Battalions were attacked by an overwhelming force, estimated between three and 5,000 Japanese soldiers. It was one of the largest attacks attempted in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Although both units fought furiously, the enemy soon penetrated the battalion's command, a combined perimeter and inflicted overwhelming casualties. In the first minutes of the attack, Approximately 30 wounded soldiers walked, crawled, or were carried into Captain Solomon's aid station, and the small tent soon filled with wounded men. As the perimeter began to be overrun, it became increasingly difficult for Solomon to work on the wounded. He then saw a Japanese soldier bayoneting one of the wounded soldiers lying near the tent. Firing from a squatting position, Solomon quickly killed the enemy soldier. Then, as he turned his attention back to the wounded, two more Japanese soldiers appeared in front of the entrance of the tent. As these enemy soldiers were killed, Four more crawled under the tent walls. Damn. Rushing them, Captain Solomon kicked the knife out of the hand of one, shot another, and bayoneted a third. Kicking, stabbing. If you had the distance and the time, you would have just shot all three. Yeah. So that just shows you how, how close fast. in this attack was, right? Didn't have time. Captain Solomon butted the fourth enemy soldier in the stomach, and a wounded comrade then shot the enemy soldier. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Captain Solomon ordered the wounded to make their way as best as they could back to the regimental aid station while he attempted to hold off the enemy until they were clear. Captain Solomon grabbed a rifle from one of the wounded and rushed out of the tent. After four men were killed while manning a machine gun, Captain Solomon took control of it. When his body was later found, 98 dead enemy soldiers were piled in front of his position. Captain Solomon's extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty are keeping within the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. Man. That's incredible. Yeah. Rambo. Yeah. That's one of my favorites there. Yeah, too. that's a yeah. good one, man. Yeah. Good I, stuff. Again, the, 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 if, whenever there's hand-to-hand combat, something's failed. Yeah. We've failed. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's ugly. It is desperate. And again, just that, the, you picture the size of the tent. It's about the size of a garage or so, yeah. you know, and to be shooting one and then having, I don't have time to shoot the second, so I'm going to plunge my bayonet into him. Yeah. And then the citation says butted. I've seen some where they, they say he head butted somewhere. He said he butt stroke. It's probably the rifle. Yeah. He's probably shoot, stab, butt stroke. You know, he's just frenzied fighting. First thing you in know? the morning too, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, just, getting ready for your day. Yeah. Man, no, well, you know everybody your back home horrific, but is getting up, having coffee. Exactly. He's running into one of the most motivated enemy ever. Right. How, how often is that happening? I mean, even in the last you know, decade of warfare in Afghanistan, when we read about these uh, Medal of Honor recipients, what were we doing those yeah. days? Who knows? Yeah, Just going to work much. a regular day. On the other side of the planet, somewhere, somebody might be Giving fighting everything. for their life in this desperate situation, doing these heroic acts that we'll read about years later, yeah. you know, but they could be happening at any given time. That's crazy. Good episode, man. So, cool, right on. Man. Yeah, so we're releasing these... Um, Every two weeks, I'm trying to put them up, so there should yeah. be a couple up by now since we filmed. Uh, that, that's what we're trying to get at. Every other Monday, I'll have these up. So any suggestions, comments, if you guys have any, um, if you want Army, Navy, Marines, or a certain war, or a certain person, let me know. We'll do our best to get them out, and then they'll be in the shuffle there. Or stories that you have from your personal family. It's kind of cool to read. So we get comments in the comment section talking about your family members that had cool stories. Yeah. We'd like to hear those, too. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys soon. Cool. Yeah.